you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the, world. in the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. It's Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. There you go. Welcome to the big show, my family and friends. We certainly appreciate you guys coming by. As always, the fr- the Chris Voss Show family loves you. Is the family that loves you but doesn't judge you, at least not as harshly as your mother-in-law. She never liked you anyway. But refer the show to your family, friends, and relatives and her, and maybe she'll like you more. Go to goodreads.com, for chess Chris Voss, LinkedIn.com, for chess Chris Voss. Chris Voss won the TikTok, the big LinkedIn newsletter, the 130,000 LinkedIn group over there, and uh, all the other places you find us on the internet. I'm always excited to have military folks on the show, at least the ones from the U.S. military. Why don't you have Russian military people on? Well, <laughs> they're the second, they're the, the second uh, worst military in Ukraine. <laughs> and most of them are dead by now. So there you go. Uh, but they'll have a new set next week. So that's why the Russian military isn't on. And I'm not welcome in Russia after just saying that. Uh, and I'm going to check the, my tea. So we, we have an amazing gentleman on the show with us today. And I'm always excited about this because we talk about leadership. And if you're not familiar, our, our the reason our military is one of the number one militaries in the world is because number, number one, I don't know why I'm repeating that, but it sounded funny in my head. You know, we're we're, we're just the greatest country in the world, of course, <laughs> whatever that means. But also, we train really well, and we have incredible leadership training that goes through all the ranks of our military, and so I'm always excited to have military folks on and talk about leadership. He's the author of the newest book that just came out, November 4th, 2023, Building Resilience for Hybrid Success Anchored in Adaptability. Raymond D. Kemp. Senior joins us on the show today, and we're going to be talking to his knowledge and experience, and he'll be imparting it all to you. And by the end of the show, you will know stuff that you never knew before and be smarter or else. Raymond D. Kemp Sr. is an American patriot appointed by President Biden to serve on the American Battle Monuments Commission. He embodies leadership in every sense of the word. With a lauded 33-year career in the U.S. Navy, he shattered glass ceilings to retire as the first black person selected to the position of Fleet Master Chief of Naval Forces Europe and Africa. His resilience against all odds has been acknowledged by the Office of the President of the United States and is reflected in his numerous awards, including the Legion of Merit, Meritus Service Medals, and the Navy Combat Action ribbon welcome to the show raymond how are you motivated prepared to serve glad to be here chris there you go and it's an honor to have you sir as well and thank you for your service give us your dot coms where do you want people to find you on the interwebs yeah raymondkemp.com you can find it's my web page on all social media i'm raymond d kemp and on linkedin same thing raymond kemp fleet master chief is how you can find me there there you go. So give us a 30,000 overview. What's inside your new book, Building Resilience for Hybrid Success? Sure. So from the 30,000 foot level, Building Resilience for Hybrid Success is, it isn't just about weathering storms. It's about learning how to, how to dance in the rain. And that's what Building Resilience, that's what the book is really about. The ABCs of leadership I developed throughout my career uh, mm-hmm. and shared on aircraft carriers, guided missile destroyers, and certainly in my last tour being attitude, belief, and character. It's my firm, firm belief, Chris, that if we have the right attitude, because our attitude determines our altitude, belief system is locked in place that is in ourselves and in the mission, vision, guiding principles of our organization, and then operate in character. There's nothing that we can't achieve. And so the ABCs of leadership, I tap into in the book as well. And just the insight of a, of a person who walks on water is different than what most people might be expecting. There you go. A resilience. And uh, what was the thing you said? Operating character. We'll get back to that in a second. But in the meantime, give us a rundown for, in your words of your background, some of the things you did in your life. What, what made you join the military and led you down that pathway? Sure. I, so I had an uncle who was in the, he, he was a retired, he was in the Marine Corps, retired from the Air Force. And when I was a kid, every, every 
morning during the summer times when I stayed at his place, all my aunts, seven of them, would go off to work, and he'd be at home telling me to go outside and pick up them twigs underneath the tree, bring in baby carrots from the garden. I thought, that's the job I want. And so I realized that there was, that was my first introduction to there is a way to retire and retire early. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I did, I scored well on the aptitude exam, decided to join the Navy because the recruiter was the most diligent and pursued me the hardest. Oh, wow. And that was, that was my reason for going. But I'll tell you, when I started, it was far from, you know, the party that I thought it was going to be. I didn't just miracle my way, you know, 20 years later to retire. And it was a tough time, you know, 86, a lot of discrimination and craziness going on. Probably won't get into it on, on this podcast unless you want to, but I had a really hit forehead to forehead interaction in a very racially discriminative and wow. environment. And this guy thought that he was sending me down a pathway that was going to be the end of me. Uh, and mm -hmm. it turned out to be the best thing that ever could have happened. And <laughs> Road through the ranks in the Navy. What we do, we test, you know, for our aptitude on our profession and then mm -hmm. we get evaluated on our behaviors and the way we are able to comply and be creative. Mm -hmm. And through that process, I stationed on a number of aircraft carriers, guided missile destroyers, did 19 years on sea duty, which means not necessarily just on ships, but in an environment where I could be immediately deployed to mm -hmm. counter an action against our nation. For example, 9-11. Mm -hmm. Working my way through the ranks, I made it to the rank of Master Chief, which is the, the highest enlisted rank. And then I went into leadership. And so I became a command master chief of a guided missile destroyer, an aircraft carrier, and ultimately the fleet master chief of Navy Europe and Africa. Now, along that pathway, various different leadership courses to include the Army Sergeant's Major Academy. So imagine a Navy dude, you know, big blue is what they used to call me, walk around the Army Sergeant's Major Academy, but very welcoming environment. I think at the highest levels amongst the elite, we are very welcome. Though we may banter heavily between each other when we're serving and learning in an environment like the Sergeant's Major Academy or in the combat zone, we're, we're together, one team and one fight. There you go. So you went through a lot of resilience training as you were getting in the military and coming up. So some of the things you talk about in your book. Yeah, definitely a lot of resilience experience. As much training as I probably could have wanted. Technically training. Was, you're right. Yeah, suck it up, buttercup is a, is a way to train, I guess. <laughs> so, <laughs> there you go. A piece of it. And so what, what do you think was in your character that led you to leadership? And, and you know, some people... You know, they they may step aside. And, I don't think leadership's for me, or they don't they don't take on that mantle. What what enticed you to want to take on that mantle of leading? It, it goes back to this town and just outside of Oklahoma City, El Reno. You know where my mm -hmm. mother's family is from. My grandmother told me once. She said, "You know, you have the ability to pay attention. Very unusual how you notice things that are small." My mother on the other hand, was telling me, because I went to a school on the west side of Oklahoma City, mm -hmm. and in, grew up born in the 60s, raised in the 70s, east side, west side was a distinguishing point for, mm -hmm. it was a racial divide. Mm -hmm. So I went to school on the west side of town, the only black kid in the school. Wow. And I mean, at every level, not the mailman, not the yard dude, certainly not the teachers and the Episcopal you know, church I was going to, but... Mm -hmm. What happened was my mother said, you're as good as any of them. So I began to believe in myself pretty early. And so mm -hmm. I, I joined the Navy and moved on. Three days into boot camp, they asked, does anybody want to be a, a squad leader? And I was like, Shh, I wow. And they were like, hey, man, what are you doing? Then, you know, the Navy stands for never again volunteer yourself. What never are you doing? Like, Nobody tell me that. <laughs> so <laughs> I put my hand up and became a squad leader responsible for, you know, 19 other knucklehead mm -hmm. recruits going through this sailorization process, teaching civilians how to be sailors. Mm -hmm. And that means that not everybody knows they're left from right when somebody's yelling at them. Not yeah. everybody, you know, knows, you know, not to w walk like a robot, you know, when they're marching, <laughs> if they've never marched before. And so the push-up machine was always ready. And the leader, of course, always has to do push-ups for everybody else. So oh, wow. uh, because I believed that I had a, a special way to pay attention to things, and I believed that I was as good as anyone else because those seeds were planted in me early. And I was a pretty 
good athlete, more than pretty good athlete, then I felt like there was nothing I couldn't do. And I always felt like, you know, as a team captain growing up, I understood what it meant to take up for that lineman that missed a block or take up for that cornerback who just got toasted for the second time for a long touchdown. <laughs> then I knew when I joined the Navy, I, I know how to help people. And so mm-hmm. my leadership journey began there. So four mm-hmm. days in up until the last day of my, you know, three decade long, three decades mm-hmm. plus career, I was responsible for somebody else. There you go. So do you, you believe in servant leadership? Is that the type of leadership you? I do. I, I believe in servant leadership. I also believe that leaders are born and made. Oh, so really? There, there are. Oh, absolutely. I think there are some people who just have the natural skill <laughs> to stand in the gap when there is trouble mm-hmm. and to run towards the fire when that thing is most mm-hmm. hot. I mm-hmm. also know that there are some people that don't and those who don't can be taught the the, the skills and at the, the skills and the mindset to take a step towards it and through the appropriate amount of sets and reps and they can run towards it. Right. And certainly modesty. Not I won't necessarily say humility because that's pretty popular these days. You know, you want to be a humble leader, blah, blah, blah. Nah. I, I I can't be overly humble believing that somebody is more important than me. I can be mm-hmm. modest and immodest, but mm-hmm. I am altruistic by nature, and I would encourage all leaders to be that way. A rising tide, Chris, floats all boats. Yeah. Be the damn tide. Yeah, so. Be the damn tide. I like that. I say that all the time, the rising <laughs> tide, but I, I don't do the be the damn tide part. I like that. I'm going to have to put that on a cup. So, it, you know, it sounds like your mother believed in you and she instilled in you very early that that belief in you that you, you were exceptional and you could go places and you were just as you were just as able bodied as anyone else. And no one was going to hold you back. And I love that. And one thing you mentioned that I thought was really interesting, you talked you mentioned earlier as we got into it, operating in character. Tell us what that means. You know, many of us feel like we have to jump into character to mm-hmm. behave in certain environments. Mm-hmm. And in authentic leadership, that that's not an option. Yeah, because you may forget to, that you're in character. You, you may happen upon a group that is not necessarily your normal you know, crowd. And if you're operating authentically, then you are able to display a high level of character at all times. And when I say character, I mean that you're behaving in such a way that it doesn't matter whether someone is watching or not. You're behaving in such a way that is just your natural response to challenges and celebrations. And your character is that reputation that precedes you before you go anywhere. So character is crucial to good leadership. So you've got to have that foundation where you've built yourself a good character, you model it, you stay in it 24-7. You're not just wearing a mask of like when you need to do the PR, you're you're putting it on in front of the employees. Right. And I and and I'm one of those folks, and I think it might be in a pretty small group that believes this, Chris, that sometimes you can have a misstep that a misstep that is tragic Mm -hmm. and then recover from that. Mm -hmm. So character is not something that is Either you got it or you don't. I mean, you can you can build that foundation and then stand on. And with the right foundation, you can put anything on top of it. So yeah. I think we're in lockstep on that. I agree with you. You know, we've, we've talked about in the show where, and in my book, about how people, sometimes CEOs for companies lead by PR. And, you know, it's just like, I'm going to put a PR notice out that says we're building an honest, trustworthy, integrity <laughs> company here. And we're that's right. what we are. And then, you know, you find out he's stealing, I don't know, staples, right. staples from the back room or something. And everybody goes, you're full of shit, as uh, right. Carla would say in that bit. <laughs> you know, and, and, and they, you know, they, they try and lead by that PR statement. And, and, and then you, you know, watch what they say. What, or what is it? Don't watch what they say. Watch what they do. Right. And. I think people, you know, in the military or, or whether they're military folks or, or whether you're employees or whether they're your children, like, you know, my, my parents are great parents, but, you know, they would tell us, don't lie. And then when we catch them in a lie, we'd be like, you're full of shit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know? uh, it, yeah, I think you're right. The being able to, to live that out and, and regrettably, there's some organizations that, in the, whether it be the C-suite as a whole or one person in there who mm-hmm. is having, who, who's writing out this glorious culture. Culture <laughs> should be this. And culture is top down. I firmly believe that. Mm-hmm. But climate, 
climate grids is bottom up. And so if the culture doesn't match the climate, and by that I mean when somebody drives up and they pull into their parking spot at, at their workplace, their thought is on their frontline leader, not on some Gucci PR statement that's been written and publicized and amplified someplace. They're thinking about that first point of contact, and that's the climate. And so if the climate and culture don't match, no matter what the PR is, that person will respond, you're full of shit if you're this not is, it out. <laughs> this is what I love about this show is because I learn stuff and I have an epiphanies. And I've never heard ta anybody talk about the climate before. But I love that, what you're talking about. Let's, let's flush that out some more because sure. mostly we talk about culture, which sure. I, I think, as you mentioned, is top down. But tell us more about the climate and how, how do you cultivate that or develop that? Or is that just a natural byproduct of the culture that maybe you see it as an entrepreneur or CEO? No, I'll tell you, and I'll, I'll use the Navy example. I reported to a ship and they've got these you know bedrock rules of behavior and here's mm -hmm. how the ship is supposed to behave and so forth. And the next thing you know, what, what I realized when I attached there is that that place was a damn soup sandwich. I mean, people were <laughs> running amok. They were led astray. It was kind of, I was all kinds of craziness going on. I was like, what in the world is happening here? Now, you know, the, the person in charge had laid out these rules, but the folks weren't just it living by that. And uh -huh. I thought, well, how do I, where's my insertion point? Because I was a senior leader at the time. Where yeah. is my insertion point? And what I found is I went in and I was, I don't know if you remember that show, the, 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 the boy, the millionaire would come in and, and act as if or the owner of the company was oh, the yeah. undercover millionaire, right? Undercover, undercover boss. Undercover yeah, yeah. CEO or something like that. Yeah. yeah. And so I, that was me. And so yeah. I was putting on, you know, the poopy suits and, you know, <laughs> doing all the grunt work and people had no idea that it was actually me. Uh -huh. And once they found out, they were like, man, this guy is legit. And I started talking uh -huh. to them uh -huh. about, well, hey, what, what do you think? You know, mm -hmm. what is this? What is this? How, how could we be doing business better? And I think it's mm -hmm. these days we would say you want to have a psychologically safe workplace, an environment mm -hmm. where people can speak out loud and not feel like they're going to get doo dooed on mm -hmm. just because they have an idea that's ridiculous. And mm -hmm. What happened is that that insertion point, you know, for the climate, from my perspective, again, that first point of contact that people have, when they realize that they had a voice, they realize that somebody cared about them and they could feel it, you know, because the, the, the old saying is people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Well, mm -hmm. you've got to display that care. And once that happens, that is where the real change in the climate can take place. And so at, in this in this real life story, and I'm just leaving a bunch of names out of it, what happened is making an insertion point at that frontline leadership uh, level for the climate. What that did is that it, it changed the attitude of the sailors that were coming back and forth to work and the civilians, as wow. a matter of fact. <clears throat> and so once that took place, we were able to start pushing the climate towards the culture Mm -hmm. which again is written in that PR statement someplace. We started pushing the climate <laughs> towards that and just created that space where people believed. And that mm -hmm. whole one team, one fight mentality came to life. And the next thing you know, it was one of the best places to work in the Navy. And so was the failure then that th there was just a PR statement for culture and maybe the leader, the CEO the, right. Absolutely. wasn't living it. And then when you came in as the leader, you're working all the, the grunt jobs, you're, 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 you're down there on the ground floor. I think a lot of people in, in the in our military leadership, you know, they're taught to work all the jobs, even if they are top brass, Very so that they can show that, you know, they understand everything. But Very so that, that that really helped match it up is, is by being the leader and matching the culture with the, or matching the climate with the culture, climate with the culture made all the difference. That, that gives me a lot to think about after this. Yeah. I I, I, you know, to your point of when it comes down to people knowing all the jobs, it's hard to give respect to a job you don't understand. Mm -hmm. And so if when I was on, on board Harry S. Truman as, a command, as the command master chief, the commanding officer and I, and also on USS Mason, the commanding officer and I would walk into the spaces the sailors would never expect us to walk into, whether it be the trash room or mm -hmm. whether it be the space where, you know, the pit snipes or you're working on the engineering auxiliary equipment and so forth. And we would spend time 
not just, I mean, standing in the trash room, which is, imagine what that's like, and tossing stuff, you know, into the machines and talking, having real conversations with the sailors. And that made a humongous difference. And so if, as there are C-suite members that are certainly listeners and others, anyone in a leadership role, I would encourage them just to understand those positions as, as, as much as logical, those positions of those folks that report to you so that you can appreciate them and give honor to those positions because that's where respect is earned. Respect is earned. You know, I, I saw this the other day. Someone wrote on Facebook. They, they, they said, respect is given. What was the second part of it? I can't remember, but I, I corrected them and I said, no, respect is not earned dignity or boy, I can't pick this up from my memory, but uh, mm-hmm. basically respect is earned. So, right. yeah, you have to earn respect. Courtesy is given. So I can be courteous and there we and, go and respectful yeah. to people, but or, or courteous and nice to people and 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 give them parlance or whatever. Uh, sure. But but they don't earn my respect. Or I think the other one was trust, and it has to mm. be earned. And so yeah, respect has to be earned. I I see a lot of that bannered around nowadays. That you know I. I deserve respect. There's a lot of deserving in the world that I hear about and a lot of entitlement. <laughs> I, <don't laughs> of, I am somebody. There's a whole lot of people believing, you know, the internet yeah. machine that they are somebody. And yeah. now you got to earn that thing. It's yeah. not freely given. Yeah, it's like we say to some of the folks who apply to the show, we're like, we're, you're not as interesting as you think you are, which is me. But, you know, I just started my own show so I could get on one. So that's how hey, I got it. That's how I did let, it. Let the truth be the truth. <laughs> we all know that after 15 years. So uh, you, you mentioned, you touched on open communication and having an environment or culture and climate where people can be, can share ideas, can speak up. I, you know, that was one of the things I built into my culture early on from the book, The Fifth Discipline. I forget, Peter, is it Peter Singe? And so I built culture into my companies early on from the get-go as an entrepreneur mm-hmm. and understood the difference was, you know, and I realized I wasn't the guy who was the purveyor of all the greatest ideas in the world. That, that ended really quick after a short while. Yeah. And, and so being able to have an environment where one of the rules we had was the only stupid question is the unasked question. Mm. And to never shame people if they ask questions, even if you know they didn't pay attention in training or the question is dumb, like you mentioned earlier, right. things like that. One of the other things you talk about, I don't know if you, you feel free to expand on that if you like, but I also like to hear your ideas in, on visionary leadership as you talk about in your book. I'd say that just kind of go back to creating a room for innovation is the, the importance When it comes down to building trust, the importance when you give someone a voice that allows them to collaborate sometimes, maybe even reaching across a space that they don't necessarily work in regularly, Mm -hmm. that creates room for organizations to be innovative. Mm -hmm. And it also creates loyalty. Mm -hmm. So when I know that I'm being heard, that I am valued and cared for, that I'm more likely to give you all I got to give and, you know, stay with that organization. As long as I believe, you know, in that PR statement and being lived out the character of the CEO. When it comes down to that innovation piece, though, that is really, really important in the the environment that we're in now. When I, You and I are about the same age or are the same age. And when we are Thinking back to, when I think back to my youth and as we, you and I were growing up, I remember folks saying, hey, you know, you need to go do this thing. And okay, was Roger that was the only, you know, two words I had. There wasn't a whole lot of, well, why do I have to do it? And why this and so forth. <laughs> and as I grew into leadership, I mean, I'm no Chris, I can imagine the number of times either we said or we heard, you always asking why, just do it because I said so. I said jump, you say how high. And what I discovered when I moved into leadership is that the only people that were truly offended by people asking why were those who don't know why. And so my perspective is, along with Simon Sinek's book, which I really jumped on 2009, 2010 or so when I went to my guided missile destroyer, Mm -hmm. I don't mind telling you the reason that we're doing it. I want you, I want things to be predictable because Mm -hmm. you're more at peace when things are predictable. So we're in combat. (laughs) I need you to know, hey, here's some things we can expect and be prepared for. There you go. Preparation is everything. I think that's what makes our military so great is you guys train for so much stuff and you train for the fans or butts and, and the, you know, the, you know, all sorts of fallout that can happen. And I think the other thing that makes our leadership great 
in, in our military. And it was, I, I joked about the Russians earlier, but the Russians, I, I never really looked at the, the stacking of the management and the leadership structures and, and stuff between the Russian and the U.S. military until we've had, you know, people like yourself on. And the Ukraine war really, like, just tore the, the Russian military's veneer of, of being the second most powerful military in the world to being the second most powerful military in Ukraine. I stole that from a State Department guy. <laughs> um, uh, but seeing their leadership structure was just abysmal. I mean, I really never looked at it until the Russian war. And, 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 and correct me how I'm not sure I have it said right, but the one thing about our military is, is you teach everyone at a level where if there's, if there's a loss of command of the command sequence in any of the teams, the, the team leader of whatever's left over can take over and make decisions on the ground or, or in real time. They don't have to sit around and go, well, we should probably wait for a cable from the Pentagon or something, right? Right now, yeah. No, there, you're, you're very right. When it, in, in our command structure, and this is in, in across the services, I've observed it. So, as mm -hmm. of course, I'm a sailor. I spent a lot of time with the Marine Corps, as well as in a tiny bit of time with the with the Army, and that's absolutely true. The the person who is in command is sharing enough of all that he knows at the unclassified level, of course, with those folks, you know, plus one, up one, down two. And so in the event, you know, something happened to say a commanding officer or sergeant major, then the person, you know, behind them can stand into the gap and and, and continue to press on it, particularly in a combat environment, press on in the fight. But administratively, that is crucial as well. Otherwise, you know, if you have a single point of failure, nothing works as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And, you know, it, in a single point of failure, like everything can come apart at the wheels. And, you know, we've heard so many stories on the show and there's so many stories, I'm sure, in life and TV and movies about how, you know, when the command is taken out, that, that you know, our soldiers, you know, rise to the leadership level and they, they save the day. There's there's all sorts of probably Purple Hearts and, and stories behind Absolutely. those sort of events. And so I think equating that into teams of your of your company as well, you know, you, you mentioned telling people the why as to how things are done. That was right. the other thing I used to have that sometimes used to annoy my employees is when we train them or they would ask questions about something like or or whatever it was, we would train them on the why. So here's how you do this or operate, say, for example, this machine. And right. here's why we do it this way. So they would not only understand the command, they would understand the the reasoning behind it. And the, part of the reason we do that is because I'd want them to innovate. So if they looked at it from their different paradigm or perspective, they could go, why do we do it this way? Maybe right. there's a better way to do it. And, right. and, and then we wanted them to have that open environment where they could come to us and go, hey, Chris, you're right. your way of doing things is stupid. Here's a better way of doing it. And I wouldn't egotistically go, well, this is my way or the highway sort of thing. <laughs> I'd be like, yeah, wow, you just saved me, you know, X number of bucks. That piece right there. So just another quick story. And I, and I love telling sea stories because they're just all true. Mm -hmm. There's a submarine deploying in, a, in an area you know, underwater and they have a... Uh, a, a device, a connector that is broke. And mm. this is a not quite mission critical device, but it's critical. Mm. And so they, you know, to order a new piece, it's, you know, 10, 15 K to have that brought out to them in the environment they were in just wasn't, that just wasn't logical, wasn't feasible. They were just going to have to do without. Mm -hmm. It turns out there is a cook and a uh, a, a, sec a secretary or an administrative person mm -hmm. who were having lunch with an engineer. And the mm -hmm. engineer mentions this problem. The administrative person says, man, I just ordered one of those pieces for, you know, the guys in this other shop. I bet you they could, it's a 3d printer, by the way. He said, I bet you they could make that. Sure enough. <laughs> you're just in an environment where people, one, understand the why the mission why mm -hmm. two they understand their own individual workplace why and then their individual why as a as a as a person on board the ship mm -hmm. realizing that they have got to be part of every solution and so just on that the, that knowledge that comfort the comfort in offering a solution they were able to save tens of thousands of dollars wow. and get that critical piece of equipment going that only happens when leaders do the same thing you did.
You, let me tell you how to operate it. Let me tell you why we operate it. Because mm-hmm. oftentimes people close to the problem have the solution. It's just yeah. whether or not yeah. they're able to, you know, voice that solution. It was a great system and, you know, not shaming people, you know, a lot of yeah. people, they don't, they don't want to point out anything like, Hey, this could be done better. Or they don't want to ask questions. You know, I, I always learned that the, having that environment of, of asking questions, the only stupid question is the unasked question. Unasked question. We'd shame yeah. you if you didn't ask the question because usually that person would end up be the one breaking, you know, the $30,000 machine okay. because he didn't, you know, he missed something in training or whatever. And, and you're like, I really wish you would have asked us, you know, how you didn't understand something. Sure. Um, <clears throat> Although I, the joke I had for earlier we were talking about is I usually ask employees to do things and every now and then somebody will be like, well, I don't really want to do that. And I'm like, I don't think you understood. I was asking to be nice. It really is a command. <laughs> I just wanted to get your buy-in. But now that we've established that's not your interest, it's hilarious. <laughs> Make sure you- Every now and then, you know, a little finger to forehead reminder is important. <laughs> Got to keep them in line. Got to keep them in line. So you offer a lot of stuff on your website. Tell us what some of your services and offering are and stuff you do there. Well, the primary thing I, I'd like folks to know that I have to offer is a keynote speeches on leadership and a couple of courses that I think would be essential for leaders, whether they're executive at the executive level or at the mid-level mid-level leadership. Mm -hmm. Uh, One is the creating a psychologically safe workplace. Super important that we're able to do that, as we discussed earlier, particularly when it comes down to innovation. Bridging the generational gap is also something that as some of the boomers are aging out and and we're making our way towards the end of our careers, Mm -hmm. uh, but still hanging on to duties and responsibilities of those who are in charge, the ability, you know, to communicate across those barriers as well as there's been a bit of a racial and ethnic challenge across our nation. I would say over the last, probably since last 10, 15 years, there's been some challenges. And during our previous president's term, there was a, a, a desire to stop being what we call politically correct. Mm -hmm. And depending on how people define that, to me, politically correct, politically correct means to treat people with dignity and respect. Mm -hmm. And when you're not, you know, not shaming, you know, someone for doing something wrong, then that to me is kind of the appropriate way for loyalty to be built within an organization. Yeah. And so the, the mission behind Kim Solutions is my desire is just change the world kind of plane. But I want to change it from the workplace outward. So mm-hmm. if we have people accustomed to being treated with dignity and respect and that dopamine, serotonin, you know, brain release that you get from that, mm-hmm. you're going to want more of that at home in your yeah. community. And then we change the world. Yeah. And so my offerings are keynote speaking and then courses and training opportunities for leadership. Hmm. Maybe I should change my paradigm to dignity is given, but respect is earned. Maybe I don't know. What do you think about that? I'm really curious. Uh, the, I I think that that's a way. That's I hadn't heard it that way. That's a way. Yeah. Because is, is the other one was courtesy is given. Courtesy. Courtesy right. should be probably in the same synopsis as dignity, but you know I'm not sure I'm going to get some KKK guy in the South to agree with me on that one. <laughs> you know those. Folks. I love them dudes, man. <laughs> There's nothing like dealing with somebody you know is opposed to you. <laughs> That's true. That's yes, true. I, I love that. I'll have to work on my, I'll have to work on if it's dignity or courtesy. I think courtesy and dignity should be the same, but I don't know. I, think, I guess both you could interpret any way you want. I group them closer. <clears throat> There you go. So anything more on your website, your services, your consulting, your coaching that you want to plug out on? Not, you know, at this, at this moment, those are the three things I'd like folks to know. If they're looking for a different way to, to accentuate, you know, the great ideas that their employees have, reach out to me and I can absolutely help you, you know, tap in with your communication to those folks and create space for them to feel heard and inspired to be part of the solution within their organization. There you go. I, I, I love what our military does. The more I studied it, when I was finishing up my book, Beacons of Leadership, I, my, one of my friends that I game with who was in the Army turned me on to the Army's Be No Do leadership training. And I started really digging through military training and, and getting exposed to it. And I was just like, holy crap, we build amazing leaders. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's, it's sad to me that more people from the military aren't brought into the public sphere of leadership. You know, we have the high amount of homeless vets and stuff like that and suicide rates. You know, 
these folks operated billions and billions of dollars worth of machines, probably trillions at this point, and and were entrusted with that. And the leadership skills that that are taught in our military to everyone is extraordinary. I mean, it's a wonder every CEO in corporate America is in the from the military. Well, uh, or at least have an advisor, you yeah. know, who can yeah. you know, help them with their perspective. Uh, yeah. Because, you know, even still, you know, only 1% of our nation has the opportunity to serve and serve well. So yeah. I think that when it, it comes down to, you know, the, the transitioning, and I, and I will take some of the fault, too, mm -hmm. just because even in, in the highest level of leadership, I probably could have done a better job of helping people understand that these leadership skills are going to transition, you know, mm -hmm. into corporate America and you will have the opportunity to be an asset there. And, and I, I, when I look back on my career, particularly the last probably seven years, I think, man, I could have done a little better job of that. Yeah. Well, there's always ways we can always improve as leaders. That's, that's what makes us great is we, we look, we reflect on that and go, okay, so how can we need to be better today? Right. And uh, so Raymond, it's been an honor to have you on. Wonderful to have you on. And you give me some epiphanies to think about. I've got to remember the rising tide lifts all boats. So be the tide. That's the line yeah. I got to remember. And yeah, then right. the climate versus the culture, et cetera, et cetera. So there yeah. you go. Thank you very much for coming on, sir. My pleasure. My pleasure, Chris. I really enjoyed it. And I look forward to next time. Thank you. Oh, your dot coms as we go out too. Oh yeah. It's uh, RaymondKemp.com. Also, you can find me at Raymond D. Kemp on Facebook and Instagram and Raymond Kemp on LinkedIn. There you go. Order of the book, folks, wherever fine books are sold. I love leadership books. They're, they're like, that's like my favorite thing in Audible. It come out November 4th, 2023, Building Resilience for Hybrid Success, Anchored in Adaptability by Raymond D. Kemp Sr. Thanks, Mon, for tuning in. Go to goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Voss, LinkedIn.com, Fortress Chris Voss. Chris Voss, one on the TikTok. Watch for this on the LinkedIn newsletter and all those places we are on the internet. Be good to each other, stay safe, and we'll see you guys next time.